in the year 1700, one of the most famous of the New England preachers, Increase Mather, made a statement of extraordinary importance, of immense consequence at the time the statement was made, and equally consequential today. He said, if the viewpoint of Solomon Stoddard grows over the next 30 years at the same pace that it's been growing over the last 30 years, it will become necessary to start churches out of churches. Now, the statement may not mean anything to many of you because you don't know anything about Solomon Stoddard. And it's not my intention to give a history lesson at this juncture, but Solomon Stoddard was the grandfather of Jonathan Edwards, and some who have a great burden and concern about revival, have had some check in their concern because they've understood that almost immediately following the great thrust of the first great awakening, Jonathan Edwards was expelled from his church. And the reason he was expelled was the very issue that increased matter was addressing. Now, it has to do with a halfway covenant, which is an issue affecting Congregationalists. The probability is I'm the only Congregationalist here. So there's no point in going into detail, though as some of you are concerned and uh, want to know something more about it, I shall be happy to speak to you privately. But the concern that I'm addressing now is what underlay this movement of the halfway covenant. When the churches began in these United States, they all held to a position of incredible consequence. They all insisted that membership in the church was severely limited to those persons who could provide credible evidence of regeneration. It was not enough to make a statement of faith. You had to prove that you had been born of the Spirit of God. But the halfway covenant compromised that position and allowed persons to participate in the Lord's Supper who could not provide credible evidence of regeneration. And so indeed, it became mandatory to start churches out of churches, because churches that were once the household of faith now just became a vast assortment of those who said they believed but could not provide any evidence of their own personal regeneration. Now that's where we're at today shocks me when I think of it, but when I started preaching in the northeast of this country 70 years ago, almost every place I was invited to preach was called liberal. But now almost every place I'm invited to preach is called evangelical. But I can't see any difference between most liberals and most evangelicals. 
this whole demand of evidence of faith has been laid aside. Now, I'd like to ask you uh, to think uh, with me about some rather obvious matters. When you read the, New, the Old Testament, do you get the impression that God had something specific in mind that he demanded of his people? For instance, at the time that God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden and told them that in the garden there was one tree that they could not eat of. Did he have something in mind? Did he have some requirement he was placing upon them? Well, obviously he was expecting obedience. He was demanding obedience of them. Or when Cain, in great anger, as a result of his brother's sacrifice being accepted and his own rejected and then confronted by God, God spoke to him uh, with immense plainness and he asked him, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is toward you, and you must master it. Was he not expecting? Was he not requiring? And is it not crushing to realize that Cain being faced by God himself with the statement that sin was crouching at his door, that he didn't cry out, help me. Instead, he disregarded what the Lord said. Now, did he disregard what the Lord said because he didn't think it was the Lord? Or when God gave the Ten Commandments, is it not obvious that he was expecting something from his people? Or when God moved Moses to write that incredible 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, in which he began by making it clear. Now, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being certain to do all his commandments, which I command you today, then the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and will overtake you. And then for the next 12 verses, he describes these incredible blessings if they would obey. But then, shockingly, Starting at verse 13, he then begins to list the consequence of disobedience. And he doesn't take a dozen verses to do that. He goes from verse 15 to verse 68, listing the curses. And there's a similar pattern in Leviticus 
26 is it not evident that God is giving great prominence to the issue of obedience. And when God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, and he said to Jeremiah, now Jeremiah, don't waste any time or effort praying for these people. For I won't listen to your prayer. Don't intercede for them. I'm not paying any attention to prayer on their behalf. And then he turns from Jeremiah and he says to the people, go ahead and make your sacrifices and offerings. What? Tell Jeremiah not to pray? and tells the people to go ahead and make their sacrifices and offerings. Yeah. The only joy they would ever know in the rest of their experience was the joy of their pharisaical religion. Going on with their sacrifices and offerings to a god They would not obey. Then God asked a question that is still of tremendous urgency today. When I brought you out of Egypt, did I ask you to offer sacrifices? Did I command you on that day to make offerings? No, this is what I commanded you. Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people and you will walk in all the way that I commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet, they did not obey, nor did they incline their ear, but they walked in their own counsel, And in the stubbornness of their evil hearts, they went backward and not forward. I don't see how anyone could read the Old Testament without coming to the conviction that God wanted a people who would obey him. But of course, he doesn't want that anymore. What he wants today is a people who have faith. Now, now faith, as it's defined in the American church, is what our fathers used to call mental assent or agreement with facts. What most evangelicals think is faith is exactly what the devil has, with one exception. We are told concerning the devil, he believes, but trembles. Most evangelicals believe, but they don't tremble. Is it not amazing that although the New Testament teaches to whom much is given, much is required, and anybody using their brain knows that in the New Testament era, we have received far more 
than anybody received in the Old Testament era. Have you ever weighed the fact that Moses didn't get a fraction of what you've got? You name any figure of consequence or inconsequence in the Old Testament period, and not one of them received anywhere near what you've received. Is it not amazing that having received little, God demanded much? But we have received much, and God expects little. That is, if you believe the nonsense called evangelicalism today. No, the simple truth is, having received more than Abram, we are required more by God. So the faith that the Bible commands is not simply acknowledging facts, facts like Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the one who died in our place, Jesus Christ, the one who was buried, Jesus Christ, the one who rose again and ascended on high. No, it's Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have in the second chapter of the Gospel of John a lesson of tremendous consequence, very appropriate to the hour in which we live. Let me read a portion. You know that in the second chapter of John, there is a very significant tie at the end of the second chapter with the early portion of the third chapter. You know that in the third chapter, we have the record of a prominent Jew named Nicodemus coming to Christ and saying to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, the typical evangelical interpretation of that is a lovely story of a man who came to faith in Christ, even though as a coward he came at night. But I want to ask you a question. Do you think Christ is as inconsistent as you are? Wouldn't it be amazing that Christ gave preferential treatment to Nicodemus because of his prominence as a religious teacher when the masses of the people who made the same claim as Nicodemus made were rejected? You say, what are you getting at? Well, look at chapter 2, the last three verses. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover. During the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing, but Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men and because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. In short, a crowd of people come saying, we believe as a result of what we see. And Christ refuses to commit himself to them because he knows what's in their heart and because he doesn't need their testimony. Now let me make a very strong assertion. Every person here who needs the acclaim of men is a danger to the kingdom of God. 
most of the false converts that are reported in this country and around the world are the result of someone needing affirmation from man. And no one has any real potential for usefulness in the kingdom of God unless they are totally liberated from all need of human affirmation. So Christ rejects the claim of faith of the crowd because it's built on sight. And faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, not based on sight. But if we could believe the average preacher today who's talking about Nicodemus, we have Christ embracing Nicodemus while rejecting the crowd, whereas they're both making the same false claim. Now look, friends, my concern at this hour is to speak to you about the nature of true faith. And in the forepart of this chapter, we have the first record of the miracle performed by Jesus of Nazareth. It's a familiar account. I could hardly interpret it in a way that would be accurate and meaningful and at the same time novel. Most of you know as much about this as I do. And I'm not going to attempt uh, to give uh, some new interpretation. But let's read it together. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were some six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Let's see, let's make it simple for minds like mine. Six pots. 25 gallons apiece. Well, 20 to 30, I think 25 is a safe figure. Six times 25, 150 gallons of wine. Now, don't get the notion this is a little wedding. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, 
the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when the men have drunk freely, then that which is poor, you've kept, however, the good wine until now. So the 150 gallons is at the end, not at the beginning. Makes the big occasion even bigger. But friends, look at how the account draws to its conclusion. This beginning of his signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Did that include Peter? Is the Bible saying Peter is a believer? Is it possible to be both a believer and a denier? But we're not going to deal with that question now. My concern is with the words that Mary spoke. Whatever he says to you, do it. Is that not what faith is? Whatever he says, do it. Faith, I repeat, is not mental consent. It is not acknowledging historic fact. Faith is active obedience. We had a reference in the earlier session to Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter. I think there are an awful lot of people in the churches with which I am acquainted with who do not understand what is said in Hebrews chapter 11. Do you? Have you ever really weighed the consequence of what is spoken there? I know it's oversimplistic, but still, it is helpful. How many letters are there in the word faith? Well, let us see now. F, A, I, T, H. Let each of those letters symbolize a portion of Hebrews chapter 11. F, facts in focus. Have you ever faced this reality? Now, faith gives substance to things that are hoped for. It provides the evidence of things not seen. That means that the person of faith has vastly more interest in that which is unseen and hoped for than that which is here and now. May I ask you, is that your story? Are you much more greatly governed by the hoped for and the unseen eternal than you are by the here and the now, that which you can taste and touch and handle. The nature of faith is that it completely alters a person's understanding of what is of consequence, so that the things of time become vastly less consequential than the things of eternity, so that the things that are tasteable and touchable mean virtually nothing in comparison with the things that are hoped for and yet to come. 
are millions of professed Christians in America who live for the moment, who have no true sense of eternity, whose decisions on a daily basis are not governed by what is hoped for or unseen, but by that which is immediate and touchable. F, facts in focus. A, active obedience. Can you name a single person in Hebrews 11 who did not do what they were told? Now, they weren't all given easy jobs. Put yourself in Moses' shoes, building that boat on dry ground. And the help you had was taunts and jeers and mean and miserable statements. And for 120 years, you're working alone obeying the Lord. What about Abraham? When he was told to leave home, did he say, no, wait a minute, Lord, you must not realize what you're saying? And what about Moses? Who considered the riches of Israel, or of Egypt, rather, of no consequence? Every person in Hebrews 11, was given something to do, and they did it, and they're doing what they were told by God himself was called faith. May I ask you, is that what faith means to you? Have you taken to heart these words of Mary? Whatever he says to you, do it. What about the people you're calling converts? Do all of your converts say, whatever Christ says, that's what I do? Well, if that were true, how can it be said that the sin rate in the world is essentially the same as in the church? How can it be that the statistics that have been gathered prove that the divorce rate and remarriage among professed believers is greater than it is in the world? Or how can it be that there are more homosexuals in the evangelical church than in the world percentage-wise? Active obedience. I. Intimacy with God. Have you considered that uh, extraordinary case described in Hebrews of a man who walked with God for 300 years and was not because God took him? How can a person think they're a Christian and they don't even know God, let alone have an intimate relationship with him. Or T, you can remember, can't you, how uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews develops after all the individual accounts, uh, then uh, the author says, it's time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, etc., etc., who, and he describes those who were sawn asunder, those who lived in caves in the earth, those who faced every human difficulty imaginable and proved that they had faith. And H, hope, hope. The end of the 11th chapter is absolutely beautiful. These all died in faith not having received the promise, for God had something better for us, that they 
without us should not be made perfect. We've got to begin to put some substance to the word faith. We've got to deny this notion that people are Christians because of a profession of faith. We've got to get back to this credible evidence of regeneration. But now let's focus on the words Mary spoke. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now those are preceded, obviously, by an unsettling statement in verse 4 when Jesus says to her, Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour is not yet come. And yet, in the face of those words spoken to her face by her son, she says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. I want to ask Bill, why did Mary command the servant to do exactly what Jesus said. Have you ever really considered what Mary had already experienced? Oh, we've come recently through the Christmas season. We know that the angel Gabriel after the time he had called upon Zacharias, appeared to Mary, and he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And then he said, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the Holy Spirit shall be called, the Holy Offspring shall be called the Son of God. Did Mary believe that? And then remember that Mary made her way to her cousin's home. And... uh, When she entered and called out her greeting, Elizabeth, now pregnant, suddenly experiences the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the child leaping in her womb is filled with the Holy Spirit as well. And then Elizabeth says to Mary, how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Did you ever weigh those words? Months before Jesus Christ is born, Elizabeth asked the question, how did it happen that the mother of my Lord should come to me. You follow the account, and it is absolutely glorious. Poor Joseph is struggling. He doesn't want to marry a pregnant woman. 
The scriptures make it clear he's a good man. And he doesn't want to put Mary away and disgrace her. But he's in the midst of this terrible struggle. And then an angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. Save them from what? The consequence of their sin, the effect of their sin, the hell that their sin deserves. No. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Has that gotten a hold of you? Could you honestly say that by the incredibly gracious and glorious work of Jesus Christ, you are being saved from your sin? The bulk of the people in the church across this land haven't been saved from sin. They just think they've been saved from the consequence of sin. But Mary understood through the man she married that his name is Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. And of course, we're also aware of the visit of the shepherds to whom an angel appears and again says to them, don't be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy which shall be for all people for today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, do the shepherds keep that to themselves? Do they say, let's not breathe a word of that to anybody? No, they make their way to the place where Mary and the child and Joseph are, and they make it clear what the angel has told them. I'm asking you, why did Mary say, whatever he says to you, do it? Why, well, she said that because she knew he was the Lord, her own son, the Lord. And when in time, Mary and Joseph made their way into Jerusalem, to present the child to the Lord in the temple. And that elderly man, perhaps about my age, may be as weak and as near perishing as I am, is standing there waiting day after day after day for the expectation of Israel. And Mary and Joseph come in, the babe in one of their arms, and Simeon reaches out, and the child is placed in his arms, and he stands there, and he says to God, now let your servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation, 
Oh, it was better than that. He was holding salvation in his arms. Salvation is not an experience. Salvation is not a process. Salvation is Christ, a person whom we can know and love and walk with and obey. But the bulk of the church doesn't know that. And then there were wise men who came seeking this babe. And when they asked of Herod, he took immediate interest, and they discerned through the power of the Spirit of God that Herod's interest was not like theirs. And they went and they made their way to where Mary and the babe and Joseph were. And they bowed down and worshipped and they presented their gifts, and they made it clear, this is God's answer to man's grievous wickedness. Is it any wonder that Mary said, whatever he says, you do it? The wonder is not that Mary spoke those words, but that so many dare to call themselves Christians who don't pay any attention to this issue of faith. I repeat, they're willing to suppose that faith is mental consent, acknowledging facts to be true, and refusing to obey. As I told you, in the year 1700, a wise and a discerning man said, if we continue in this process of making wide open the kingdom of God, the day will come when we'll have to build churches out of churches. We're living at a time when the vast majority of evangelical preachers don't have the foggiest notion of what it means to be born again. Who know absolutely nothing personally about the salvation that Simeon held in his arms. It's almost as if the average person who calls himself a Christian thinks God overbuilt when he built heaven. You got this vast place, and it stands nearly empty, and he's called upon them to fill it up. And so, in order to get as many to respond as possible, they've understated the facts. They've made it sound as if anybody can love themselves and be saved. And they have welcomed into their churches tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people who think they're Christians and are not. But as Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is it not a crushing disappointment? But Nicodemus didn't say, I don't understand. Please help me. And instead, ask a stupid question. How can a man 
when he's old, be born again. I believe the Lord has been incredibly kind to me. Many people say, aren't you going to retire? Well, my understanding of retirement is you leave something you don't like very well to do something you really like. But that's what I've been doing for 70 years. <laughs> and I don't know anything in all my life that's been more glorious than to stand before an audience, people leaning casually against the back of their seat, and paying ever so slight attention, many of them with blank looking faces. <laughs> and then to watch the change in the countenance. And even to watch sometimes an entire congregation move forward to the edge of the seat, often hanging on to the rail of the pew in front of them, listening as if the whole of their eternity hung on the word being spoken. And then to have sometimes many rush up afterward and say something like, I don't know exactly what happened to me, but something incredibly wonderful has happened today. Born again, not by the will of the flesh, not by the will of man, but by the word and the Spirit of God. That's the desperate need of the hour, so that we have masses of people who are saying, whatever he says to you, do it! That's where I am! That's where you must be!